The gift of the land of Israel by God is an essential element in Jewish identity, religiously, and politically. That the gift came at the expense of the local Canaanites has stimulated deep reflections and heated debate in Jewish literature, from the creation of the Bible to the 21st century. That was the abstract of the book, The Gift of the Land and the Fate of the Canaanites in Jewish Thought, that was published in 2014. But who are the Canaanites that created a lot of holes in the fabric of the Jewish identity and their claim of authentic ownership over the Holy Land? When the pharaohs ruled Egypt and the ancient Greeks built their first cities. A mysterious group of people called the Canaanites dominated the Near East. Around 4,000 years ago, they built cities across the Levant, which includes present-day Lebanon, Israel slash Palestine, Jordan, and parts of Syria. Yet the Canaanites left no surviving written records. The Bible's Old Testament tells us a very dramatic story. It says the Israelites, following God's command, completely wiped out the Canaanites to take over Canaan or Canaan. But wait, did they really vanish? Let's look at the evidence. Archaeologists tell us something different. The Canaanite cities were never destroyed nor deserted. And now, science brings a new page. This puzzle. In a city called Sidon in Lebanon, a scientist named Mark Haber, a geneticist at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in Hingston, made a groundbreaking discovery. He extracted enough DNA from the ancient skeletons to sequence the whole genomes of five Canaanite individuals, all around 3,700 years old. Guess what? The Canaanites were a mix half local farmers from 10,000 years ago and half from folks who came from Iran around 5,000 years ago. But the real surprise came when Haber compared this ancient DNA with people living in Lebanon today. It turns out modern day Lebanese are mostly the descendants of the Canaanites. More than 90% of their genes come from them. The discovery challenges two big claims often heard by modern-day Zionists. The Canaanites are actually ancestors to many people in the Middle East today. The Canaanites weren't wiped out. They survived and continued to live in the region. So it looks like the first people to call this land home were not the ancestors of modern-day Jews. Out of today's Middle Eastern populations, isn't history full of surprises? Imagine a land that's been the focus of so many empires and armies, it's almost like a crossroads of history. This land we're talking about has seen more rulers than we can count. Let's start with Egypt. For over 300 years, during the Late Bronze Age and early in the Iron Age, they were the bosses of Canaan. The Hyksos, who were originally from Canaan, took over part of Egypt for a while. Eventually, Egypt pushed them out and got really involved in Canaan. But then came the Sea Peoples. These mysterious groups shook things up, attacking and settling all over, including in Canaan. They caused such a stir that even powerful Egypt started losing its grip. Local Canaanite cities began to stand up for themselves. They got help from new big players like the Hittites, Assyrians, and Babylonians, who were all eager to challenge mighty Egypt. Among these new faces were the Philistines. They settled on Canaan's southern coast and established their own cities, becoming a major force in the region. Then, as Egypt finally stepped back, the Israelite tribes started to come together in Canaan. This time is what the Bible talks about when it mentions the judges and kings like Saul, David, and Solomon. But the story doesn't end there. After the Israelites, the Babylonians, Neo-Hittite states, Arameans, and Persians all had their time ruling this land. Over time, the name Canaan faded away, replaced by names like Israel, Judah, 
Philistia, or just part of whichever empire was in charge. But here's a key point long before the Jewish religion began. This land was Canaanite territory. And the list of conquerors just keep on going. Alexander the Great, the Hellenistic rulers, the Maccabean dynasty, the Roman and Byzantine empires, various Islamic caliphates, the Crusaders, back to the Islamic rule, then the Ottoman Empire, the British, and finally, modern day Israel. This land with its incredibly rich history has been a magnet for empires and armies throughout time. This land belongs to a lot of nations and cultures. Each left its mark, but we cannot forget it all began with the Canaanites. Zionism is not Judaism. No matter how many times a Zionist will forcefully convince you otherwise, they won't be able to change the fact that Zionism is a nationalistic movement, while Judaism is a thousands of years old religion. Zionism was created by a lawyer in Europe, seeking to create an illegitimate state, a country to be created on land with no people for people with no land. But the harsh reality was, this did not exist. There was never a land with no people. Theodore Herzl, often credited as the father of modern Zionism, advocated for the establishment of a Jewish homeland. This movement, initially secular in nature, gained momentum, particularly after the Holocaust, leading to the founding of the State of Israel in 1948. At that time, a big number of Jews were living in the Holy Land and others across the globe. When Zionism started, a big number of Jewish rabbis rejected this idea completely. When they rebelled against it, they were silenced mocked, and in some cases, killed. Rabbi David Weiss is part of the anti-Zionist, yet Jewish group that never stopped protesting against Zionism. Totally uh, a, a criminal and uh, a um, anti-religious, not only, I don't want to, the, the issue is not that they're not only they're not practicing the religion, but it's contradictory to the religion. The Zionist movement is contradictory because um, Judaism is subservience to God. And this movement is claiming, and one of the main claims is that they have to take guns and protect themselves because God is not protecting us. Mm -hmm. We would put our, uh, our trust in the Almighty, in God, and these people scoffed at that. They ridiculed the Jews who are putting their, their trust in the Almighty and said, we're going to take the land without, with guns. Let's talk about Jerusalem, a city that's more than just a place on a map. It's a city with deep meanings for billions of human beings across different religions. Some modern day Zionists say Jerusalem is only sacred to the Jews. But that's not the whole story. Jerusalem is a treasure trove of history and spirituality for many. For Christians, Jerusalem is a city of immense significance. It's where Jesus, the central figure of Christianity, preached, died, and was resurrected. This makes it a key site for Christian faith and history. Now let's talk about Islam. In Jerusalem stands the Al-Aqsa Mosque, a place of deep importance, yet sadly, a site of frequent tensions. For the nearly two billion Muslims worldwide, this mosque isn't just another building. It's the third holiest site in Islam. The Quran mentions Al-Aqsa multiple times. It's where Prophet Muhammad journeyed one night from Medina, prayed, and then ascended to the heavens. Jerusalem is much more than just a city for one faith. It's a city that holds stories, prayers, and histories of Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike. It's a crossroads of faiths, a testament to the shared and diverse histories of the Abrahamic religions. This city, with its ancient walls and sacred sites, is a mosaic of beliefs and traditions, important to many, not just to one. <laughs> Cairo. 
هولا اليهودي أبو الفادي ابن حزداي بهية ابن بقودة إسحاق البلية حزداي ابن شبروت Zionists love to claim that Jews used to live as second-class citizens under the Islamic rule but this is far from the truth The first guy mentioned Kaula al-Yahudi was a military commander a general of the 8th century appointed by Tariq ibn Ziyad himself The second one, Abul Fari ibn Hazdai, was an 11th century philosopher, poet, mathematician, physician, and political figure in Zaragoza. The third one, Behiyah ibn Bakhuda, was a Jewish philosopher and a rabbi who lived at Zaragoza and in Dallas, now Spain. He was one of the two people known as Rabinu Bihai. The fourth one, Ishaq al baliya or Isaac al baliya was an Andalusian Jewish mathematician, astronomer, astrologer, and Talmudist. The fifth one, Hazdai ibn Shabrut, was a Jewish scholar, physician, diplomat, and a patron of science. He was also the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Cordoba. Or the most famous of them all, Ramban or Maimonides, who is a Sephardic Jewish philosopher that became one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages. Jews across the globe now continue to study his books. All of those were part of what historians call the Golden Age of Jewish Culture in Spain, which refers to the time of Muslim rule, which was a period of remarkable cultural, economic, and philosophical flourishing of the Jewish community in Spain, particularly in the Islamic parts of the Iberian Peninsula, known then as al Aldalus. This was 1,000 years ago when humanity did not understand the concept of multiculturalism as it does now. Contrast this with the situation in Europe during the same period, often referred to as they Dark Ages. There, under Christian rule, Jews faced violence, pogroms, and forced conversions, especially during the Crusades. Does this prove anything other than one fact? Let me state it clearly. Muslims did not have a problem living with Jews. Let's delve into the complex story of Gaza and its governance. Israel often says that Gaza has been governing itself since 2006, but the reality is much more complicated. Rewind to 1967 and the Six-Day War. After this conflict, Israel occupied the Gaza Strip this control continued until after the Oslo Accords, the Palestinian Authority got some degree of self-governance in parts of Gaza. However, true self-governance for the Gaza Strip was always a challenge. A stark example, the destruction of Gaza's only airport multiple times. In 2007, everything changed. Hamas, an Islamist political and military organization, took control of Gaza after winning the 2006 Palestinian legislative elections. This led to a blockade by Israel, tightly controlling what and who goes in and out of Gaza. The main entry points for goods and people are closely watched by Israel. The blockade hasn't been without its consequences. It's been a key factor in several intense conflicts between Israel and Hamas, including major military operations in 2008 and 9, 2012, 14, and now. Also, have you ever heard of the Israeli concept of mowing the lawn in Gaza? Please look it up. Please. These conflicts have been devastating with significant loss of life and widespread destruction in Gaza. The Israeli agency in charge of this blockade is Kugat, the coordinator of government activities in the territories. Part of the Israeli Ministry of Defense, Kugat plays a crucial role in carrying out government policies in the Palestinian territories, including both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. What would you call this other than colonization? This has to be the most saddening part of the whole story. We're not even sure where to start. Let's talk about Muhammad. A Palestinian man living in the West Bank starts his day early, knowing that his commute to work will be lengthy and unpredictable due to the Israeli military checkpoints he must pass through. These checkpoints, a staple of life under occupation, 
often lead to delays, affecting not just Muhammad, but thousands of Palestinians who travel for work, education, or medical needs. Muhammad works in construction, sometimes in Israeli settlements, a common job for Palestinians in the area. He carries the necessary permits, a requirement for his daily travel, but still faces the uncertainty of whether he will be allowed to pass or delayed for hours. Rami, Muhammad's young son, faces his own set of challenges as a schoolboy in the West Bank. His route to school is occasionally disrupted by military presence or temporary checkpoints. Let's meet May, Rami's cousin. May is a young Palestinian woman, and her daily life is really tough. Every day, she has to be searched by soldiers from the Israel Defense Forces. Imagine having to go through this every single day. It's not just a quick check. It feels invasive, getting sexually harassed. It's like her privacy and dignity are being taken away every single day just because she needs to get from one place to another. For May, and many others like her, these security checks feel a lot like harassment. And it's a big part of what makes her day-to-day -day life so challenging. Okay, what about the night visits? You have a new unit in town. They just finished training. The first time they're deployed. You don't want the first arrest operation they carry out to be the real thing. So you send them on a mock arrest before. You choose the most peaceful, quiet Palestinian village in the area where you served. Open an aerial photo of the village. Choose a random house in the village. Pick up the phone. Call the Secret Service. Make sure that the guy living in the house you've chosen randomly is innocent. And that by operating on him, you are not interfering in intelligence gathering operations that the Secret Service has in the area. Once you get the go, meaning he's innocent, and you're not interfering in Secret Service business in the area, you come in the middle of the night, you surround the house, grab the guy, handcuffed, blindfold, as if it's a real arrest, put him in a jeep. After five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, someone goes on the radio, says, end of exercise, stop the jeep, release the guy, go back to the base, and go to sleep. So you're probably wondering why the hell to do it. Actually, soldiers who get these orders usually also wonder why the hell we're doing it. We know the guy is innocent, so why are we doing it? And they ask their commanders, and you know what many soldiers heard back? Mainly two reasons. One is training. As close training can be to reality, better. So if you can do it on a real Palestinian village, on a real Palestinian house, on a real Palestinian man, better. But the second reason is even more interesting. Think of it, a mock arrest is just another advanced way of making your presence felt. You go in the middle of the night to the village, surround the house, some noise, some movement, lights, shouting, military movement in the village, people wake up, they know you're here. They see you arresting a person that they know he's innocent. They're not stupid, yeah? People in the village usually know. So they start to ask questions. Why the hell are you arresting him? He's innocent. But then they see that you released him. So what the hell is going on here? Arrest, released. Is he a collaborator? Yes, no. And they don't find the answers, so they're even more scared. When you know what's waiting behind a corner, you can calculate. When you have no idea what's waiting around the corner, that's when you're really terrified, right? Because when the goal is intimidation, the lack of logic is the perfect logic. Have you ever understood the word dehumanization? Can you look online for Israel Skin Bank and Palestinians? And while you're doing this research, I want to play some funny TikToks that were trendy at one point by Israelis in the West Bank. <laughs> Imagine dehumanizing an entire ethnicity to the point where it becomes a joke you encourage your children to participate in. Speaking of indoctrination. And after a paratrooper was killed in uh, the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Um, so it was really like, not if, but when. One of my first operations ever um, was uh, entering a Palestinian home. You take over a house and use the house as a military point. Um, and I remember the feeling uh, of entering someone's house in the middle of the night, waking an entire family up, um, locking them in a room, and the house was ours. Um, and I look, and I try to find justifications for it. I try to convince myself that this was okay. I just, I, I couldn't convince myself anymore. How would you feel if you went shopping for grocery on a Saturday morning for your family? That day, you decided to take your kids with you. The house was empty. No one was there. You come back home and you see a big man in the house 
Actually, he locked the door. You cannot come into the house. He comes out and tell you he decided to take your house. You are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is gonna steal it. No, no one, no one uh, uh, is allowed to steal it, Yami. Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I didn't do this. But you It's you... easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. Yeah, you are helping. stealing my house. The settlers can imprison normal Palestinians if they just decided to. I will not speak with you. There is a soldier. The soldiers? Yes. What are they doing here? We are prison here. What's happening? They, they are uh, keep, keeping here and the soldiers upstairs. We cannot move, we cannot speak with you. You can't leave the house? No. They told you that? Yes, I can't breathe. You How can't... long are they going to stay? I don't know. Are they paying you any money? <laughs> you are kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Abdul Nasif, the bank manager, said he had to get to his bank to open the safe, but that soldiers won't let him go. He told us when the soldiers come, they wake everybody up and herd them into a kitchen for hours while soldiers sleep in their bedrooms. They can't leave or use the phone or let us in. Maybe the best answer from the Zionist point of view of why there are settlers in the West Bank can be answered by the biggest shell of Zionism ever known to man, Ben Shapiro. In 1948, the Zionists declared the State of Israel and presented the local Arab population with an ultimatum, live under the Jewish state, as Israelis or leave the area. Those who did not choose between these options faced lethal consequences. They got killed. <laughs> אם היה עומד, עומדת כיתה של זה עם ידיים למעלה, אז באותו יום הייתי רואה אותה, הייתי קוצר את כולם עד כדי כך. כמה אתה חושב אנשים הרגת ככה? <laughs> לא ספרתי. <laughs> לא יכול לדעת בחיי. היה לי, היה לי מקלה עם 250 כדורים. <laughs> ואני, תראה, יריתי, נלחמתי כולם. <laughs> לא יכול לספור. The descendants of those who acquiesced to the ultimatum and chose to stay where they were born and had lived their entire lives were later referred to as Arab Israelis or Arab 48. Zionists often claim that Arab Israelis lead amazing lives, highlighting their earnings, the quality of their jobs, and the extent of religious tolerance and freedom they enjoy. But the question here is so simple. So what? Just before Israel was declared a state, hundreds of thousands of Jews were living in Arab countries, Arab Muslim countries, enjoying the same religious tolerance that Christians and Muslims also experienced. They had synagogues everywhere in Egypt, Morocco, and Yemen. They ate what the people ate. They wore what the people wore. They spoke the people's language. They held the same jobs as everybody else. Speaking of synagogues in the Middle East, I grew up in a neighborhood in Cairo region named Heliopolis. This was an ordinary neighborhood with a Muslim majority. If you go to Google Maps right now and search for Heliopolis Synagogue, you can still see it till this day. 
Similar synagogues can be found anywhere in the Middle East. Just do a search. Nonetheless, just before the unnecessary declaration of the State of Israel in 1948, Jews were treated the same as everyone else. This was exactly the case during the Islamic Golden Ages, where Jews enjoyed the same treatment as other citizens. This confusing claim has been maliciously constructed by Zionists with the aim of swaying public opinion away from the fact that Jews and Muslims, or Arabs, have never had a problem living together in one place. There are many theories about Israel's objectives, and you can find a wide range of them on the internet. These range from the idea of greater Israel, based on the borders mentioned in the Old Testament, to ambitions of controlling the entire Middle East. When you talk to different people in Israel, you get different perspectives. Hardcore Zionists claim they don't want more land than they currently have, but questions about why Israel hasn't defined its borders still linger. Ordinary Israelis, like those you might meet on the streets of Tel Aviv, often express a desire for security. They're not super excited about the ad that notifies them about the incoming rockets. When you ask a settler in the West Bank, you can't get an answer because those people do not know what they want. They're mostly demonically possessed creatures. You cannot talk to those types. Israel clearly wants to continue on being a state. You do not kill thousands, hundreds of thousands of humans for the sake of a goal and decide otherwise later on. Whether this state is big as the Bible's Israel or it is as big as the whole Middle East. It doesn't matter. Israel as a state needs to be agreed upon by its neighbors or they will never stop attacking it. It just makes sense. When Elon Musk was asked what should Israel do, he mentioned doing an inconspicuous act of kindness that will make everyone around Israel love Israel. Israel is an illegitimate entity that was cancerously implanted in a historically harmonious, massive multiculturalism society, and it is forcing everybody there to acknowledge it on its own terms. Israel could want a better goal, which is the assimilation as a Middle Eastern, non-Western entity in a Middle Eastern greater society. But too bad. Israel wants the impossible. What Israel wants can never be achieved. I'm sorry, Elon, but you don't get it. No one will ever accept a cancerous cell until it turns benign. Palestinians want what you want. They want dignity. They want peace. They want a place to call home. They want to be able to go pray without an Israeli soldier throwing a bomb in the mosque while they are praying for a TikTok prank video. their own legitimate army like every other country they want to have their own airport they want their families in the diaspora to be able to get back to their homeland they want to leave the biggest concentration camp ever known to man they do not want to live in a world where lies keep perpetuating over and over about them from others who sold their souls to the devil <laughs> Zionists love to claim another false claim of theirs, that Palestinians rejected peace multiple times. This is false because never was a real respectful peace treaty offered to the Palestinians. If you are a Trump supporter, then you would not like to know the fact that Trump was the first president to tarnish the Palestinian cause when declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel in 2017. This while he presented the worst peace accurate ever given to them across the years. Why are you surprised? He's the biggest Israel fanboy. Yep, nobody loves Israel more than him. And this was the case for every other US president in the last 50 years. 
almost all of the U.S. administrations have presented peace proposals that fall short of meeting the basic expectations of the Palestinian side, especially concerning the 1967 borders and full autonomy over their own Palestinian land. After such proposals were rejected, they are the first ones to blame the Palestinians. Have you ever listened to the Palestinians? Have you ever actually cared about what they want? Then why are you blaming them? Please read about APAC and their influence on the entirety of American politics. Let's talk about why some countries have big armies and others don't. Take Canada, for instance. It doesn't have a huge army, and a big reason for this is its location. Canada's only neighbor is the USA, a long-term ally. So, Canada doesn't feel the need for a large military force. Now, let's shift our focus to Israel. The situation there is quite different. Israel does have a sophisticated and sizable army, but having a big army doesn't automatically make a country a victim. In this case, it's more about how Israel fits into its neighborhood, the Middle East. Imagine moving into a neighborhood and not getting along with your neighbors. That's a bit like Israel's situation. If you're seen as an outsider and you force your way in, it's not surprising if the neighbors aren't welcoming the story of Israel is unique in modern history. It's rare for a group of people to arrive in a region, declare a state among the native population and not expect any resistance. This kind of situation naturally leads to tensions. Israel's presence in the Middle East is not seen as natural by anybody. And to maintain its position, Israel relies heavily on support from outside, particularly from Western countries led by the USA. This support is not about friendship, it's also about influence. The West, especially the USA, sees Israel as a key ally in the Middle East, reason of strategic importance. So the support to Israel's military is also about maintaining Western interests in the area. Whether or not in Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Israel is the single greatest strength America has in the Middle East. Imagine our circumstance in the world. Were there no Israel? How many battleships would there be? How many troops would be stationed? Were I a Jew, I would be a Zionist. My father pointed out to me, I did not need to be a Jew to be a Zionist. Zionists killed an insane number of human beings over 75 years, even from before that. They assassinated their own rabbis who opposed Zionism. They assassinated world leaders who opposed Israel. They detained and still detain thousands of Palestinians every day. Almost all of them never had and never will get a fair trial. And through Zionist propaganda, they call them terrorists. How can a 10 years old become a terrorist? How about the minister of Israel who killed a Palestinian just because he can? Is it worth a nation? The US did this 300 years ago by slaughtering hundreds of thousands of Native Americans. But is this allowed in the third decade of the 21st century? Can we stop this now? Is it the 1700s again? Are we still living in the past? Or what is our future? True peace in the Holy Land might be realized through a unified state a place where everyone, irrespective of their religious or ethnic background, can coexist. This land, rich in history and cultural significance, doesn't exclusively belong to any one group. If we acknowledge that Jewish people have a history in this region, it's equally important to recognize the long-standing presence of various Middle Eastern communities. Over thousands of years, numerous nations and cultures have left their mark on this land, contributing to its diverse heritage. 
This land cannot be a Jewish state, Muslim state, or a Christian state. This land cannot belong to one religion. History has shown that diverse groups can live peacefully together in this region. What's needed is a genuinely democratic state that extends from the river to the sea, where everyone with historical ties to the land can freely embrace and inherit their ancestral heritage. Everyone who has ever lived there should be able to freely inherit their ancestors' heritage. Those who lack recorded modern ancestry in this land should not overthrow the indigenous communities. It's scandalous and infuriating that the Israeli government grants Jews worldwide who cannot provide a single piece of evidence of a trace in their bloodline to the Holy Land, the right to return to the land of Israel, simply just because they're Jewish. While Palestinians like Muhammad Hadid, who actually lived there before 48, and his whole lineage of Bella Hadid and her siblings cannot touch this land. This type of injustice cannot be witnessed by us humans in the third decade of the 21st century. If you're okay with this, then please do us all a favor and never ever claim the title human. You can start by asking your own government to condemn Israel and impose sanctions. A simple but great act of pausing diplomatic relations with Israel can be a start. You can donate to Palestinians. You can make sure to stop donating to Israel if you ever did or intended to. You can boycott Israeli products. Please read about BDS. You can boycott companies that are in support of Israel. Please read more about BDS. You can provide support online to the Palestinian people. You can condemn Israel online so nobody ever forgets. You can participate in peaceful protests against Israel. And remember, being anti-Israel is not anti-Semitic. Do not let them lie to you like how Israel lied to the whole world.